Well, hello again. It's good to be with you again this week. I'm really excited about the lesson that we're starting today. Uh, I've been teaching some out of Malachi chapter 1 for the last you know, few weeks, different places. But uh, today, I believe the Lord has <laughs> finally released me to teach the book of Malachi line upon line, verse by verse. And I, you know, I don't know whether it's going to be it's going to take a while. We're not going to get it all done today for sure. <laughs> and um, I think the reason, though, that I'm excited about this, uh, the book of Malachi to me is so important for today. It's the book of Malachi was uh, it's the last prophet in the Old Testament. It's uh, one of the messages that I where I taught on it recently. I, I said Malachi was like the last call. It's the final. God's given him one more chance. I, to be honest with you, I kind of feel that way about America right now. And if you're watching from another country, it, it may or may not apply to you. But in America, it sure does. I think America's God's going to give us another chance. I pray He does. And if that's the case with well, the, the Book of Malachi, what He said to His people then, God doesn't change. He's saying to His people now. And uh, so, to me, it's 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 extremely relevant for today. Now let me mention this, we're going to, when you look at the an Old Testament prophet, you have to understand it two ways. Number one, they, they were under the first covenant, they were under the law, they were still under the blessings and the cursings of the law, and uh, we know that we know, because we have the New Testament, that the law was given as the schoolmaster to show mankind you need a savior, because no one could keep it. No one could keep the law, no matter how hard they tried. Prophet Jeremiah said, there's none righteous, no, not one. Even though many people tried, and God, you know, God accounts them and, and uh, was highly, he, he loved them and favored them, King David and, you know, uh, Moses and Abraham and on and on. But still, there was none righteous, no, not one. So, you have to read it with the, in two ways. Number one, with the understanding what God was doing at the time. He was dealing with the people that were not born again. Dave used to call them little flesh creatures, you know, but God loved them and he's trying to save them and, and uh, keep them and make covenant with them and be their God. And so there's that aspect of for, for the, their dispensation when they were under the law. But see, everything in the Old Testament is prophetic, pointing to Jesus, pointing to the New Covenant. So when you look at it with those lenses, as you'll see, there's so many types and shadows of Jesus Christ, of Christianity, of how we are to live today. Uh, you'll, you'll see the parallels are just amazing. It's astounding. And then there's one more aspect, not only does it talk about Christianity? So in other words, it's you got to look at it from the perspective of the people that were under the law. Then you look at it from the perspective of how does it speak about our covenant, uh, the second covenant, which is established on better promises. And then lastly, how does it apply to us individually? I think you're going you're gonna to find a lot of things as we go through here. The Holy Spirit's going to deal with you. Uh, some good and some not so good, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is really good because we all need change. All right, let me give just a little bit of a brief history of the book of Malachi. Uh, there is a little bit, if you read all the different commentaries and experts, and I'm not a, I'm not a Greek or Hebrew expert, but I'm able to read uh, by those who are. But there is somewhat of a controversy, even whether the book of Malachi is the final whether he was the final prophet. Some say Joel was the final prophet. But uh, to me, uh, we'll get into this more when we get to chapter 3, but to me the book of Malachi makes a perfect bookend for the Old Testament. And John the Baptist makes a perfect bookend to begin the New Testament. Because in chapter 3 of Malachi, he actually speaks of the coming one the voice who would be saying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, which is exactly the message that John the Baptist came with. Repent ye, uh, prepare ye the way of the Lord, and, 
and he was turning Israel back to the to the the covenant, and then he's the one that announced the uh, the Lord. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in Malachi chapter three, when we get there, you'll see that the prophet Malachi spoke of John the Baptist, didn't call him by name, but spoke of him and his message, who would prepare the way for the Lord, who would suddenly come to his temple. There, he, well, you remember when Jesus came into the temple and it wasn't a pleasant day for them because he drove out all the money changers. Malachi speaks of that. So to me, I think Malachi is the perfect bookend. It's, I believe he was the, the final prophet. Now what's going on, this is the book of Malachi is after the 70 years of captivity in uh, Babylon. Uh, it's after the time when King Cyrus, uh, the first issued the edict that they were to return and to rebuild the temple. And that process has taken quite a while. In fact, there was a long delay. They, they began the work, laid the foundation, but then through uh, resistance and, and complacency, to be honest with you, uh, and even government interference, the building of the temple was delayed for a long time. And you have prophets in the Old Testament that speaks during that time to get the temple rebuilt. Well, they do. They finally rebuild the temple. So now get this, the, they, they have returned from captivity after 70 years. The temple has been rebuilt. The priests are offering the sacrifices. And, and in other words, the function of the temple is, is reinstated. And this is during the time when Nehemiah has come. Ezra has already read the law. Nehemiah has come now to, re in other words, the temple is built. Now it's time to rebuild the, the walls around Jerusalem. And it's in that process, that's where we are, when the prophet Malachi comes on the scene and begins this final warning. Because what you're going to find out as we go through here, I have to do a little preview just to kind of give you an understanding. I mean, after all, everybody at the time knew what was going on. When the prophet Malachi spoke, they knew what was happening. So what you're going to see is, see, when you would think after 70 years of captivity and then God graciously allowing you, just by grace alone, allowing you to come back to your homeland, rebuild the temple, and now he's rebuilding, allowing you to rebuild the walls of the city, you would think gratitude would be the attitude of <laughs> gratitude would be the attitude you would, <laughs> gratitude would be the attitude of heart that the people would have and if they would be so thankful oh we didn't deserve it God see we're already looking at grace aren't we from the New Testament we didn't deserve it God we'd we, Lord you you told us about our ancestors the ones who brought judgment on the nation how they even brought idols of Baal into the temple and they worshiped Baal right in front of the Holy of Holies, right in your face. And they, then how, even Solomon, he built temples to these heathen gods and, and Moloch and, and Cheroth and all, I can't think of all of those names, but so many different heathen gods and they even allowed uh, uh, immorality as part of worship by building certain brothels right next to the temple for easy access, you know, oh, I'm going to go worship. I bet you are. So anyway, <laughs> Lord, we're so sorry that our four, it should be this attitude. We're so sorry, Lord, that our forefathers, you told them one time that our ends, our ancestors, they, they, they got so bad. You said they were worse than the heathen nations that you drove out of this land to give to them. You said they'd actually become worse. Oh, God, we're so sorry for the sins of our fathers. We're so sorry for our own sins. Well, we've learned our lesson after the 70 years of captivity. We're going to do everything right. We, we, we love you. We worship you. We're going to do everything the way you want. We're going to live for you from here on. See, you would think, you would think that would be the attitude of heart. But you're going to find out it was completely different than that. Uh, already in this short span of time, the people's heart, just, to be in a, just to really kind of summarize, they're just going through the motions. Yep, the temple's been rebuilt. We have to do it because it's kind of like, you know, kids when they're little and you, you force them to clean their room. 
I'll, I'll clean it because I don't want I don't want my allowance taken away. In other words, it's the same thing: blessing and cursing. Blessed if you do, cursed if you don't. You know, there'll be ice cream if you clean your room. There'll be a spanking if you don't clean your room, type of thing. Well, that's kind of what's going on here, and they're just going through the motions. They have no heart in it. They they're not honoring God, and you'll see all of this. Well, God's given them a last warning. He's He's going. Now, I'll just go ahead and tell you this ahead of time. Well, I'll say it. I want to say many things many times because that's what teachers do. You know, you didn't you didn't learn your ABCs by hearing them once, did you? <laughs> didn't learn multiplication tables by saying them once. All right. I hope they still do that in school so you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, <laughs> that I'll tell you what the book of Malachi is about. It's about honoring God. More than once, he says, where is my honor? Where is my respect? Where, well, how is it that you, you're just going through the motions and there's no real love, no honor, no reverence, no fear of God? That's really what the book of Malachi, if I had to sum it up in what, just one sentence, God, it's God saying, where is my honor? Hmm. Anyway, and again, I, boy, if that doesn't apply to America today, and I mean Christianity, some of the things that I read about that's happening in Christian churches, I don't know if the Lord will have me speak on any of that. Probably not. That's a, that'd probably be a different thing. But boy, where is my honor? <laughs> where is my honor would be a good question, even in the church today, much less America as a whole. And uh, these last, the book of Malachi is to the whole world. If you live in another nation, I'm sure you'll see application in your nation also. But I live here, so I can't help but see it. All right, so one more time, I'm seeing the, my little timeline again. Understand this is, this is after the temple has been rebuilt. The priests are offering sacrifice again. The, the, uh, they're going through all of the, the motions of what's required in the law because the temple is there now. And uh, Nehemiah is in the process of leading the people to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. But God's, God's not pleased with the attitude of heart. And this is like the last prophet. This is the final warning. Now just think about this. After this warning, this final warning and, and from uh, the prophet Malachi, it's God speaking through his prophet. Just think about this. The, there's not the voice of it. There's not the voice of God heard through another prophet for roughly 400 years. When Malachi finishes, it's roughly 400 years before the voice of a prophet is heard again in Israel. And that's when John the Baptist. Here comes a voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And boy, he was a wild man with wearing goat skin and eating wild locusts and honey. And here comes about 400 years. You could go back to the parallel of Egypt. I mean, there it's the last chance. That, you know, they were in Egypt for a little over 400 years in bondage. Well, God's calling out to them. He's, he's given them a chance through the prophet Malachi. I believe he's given America a chance. I believe he's given your nation a chance. I believe he's given the church a chance to repent. All right, here we go. So, and I am during. So this is a more of a teaching series. Um, I'm going to go very much line upon line. Uh, we'll be bringing in a few other things. I mean, there's so much more that could be taught. I'm not at all saying this series will be exhaustive on the book of Malachi, but we're not going to leave any verses out, and we're going to go very methodically. I'm going to listen as best I know how, even in the preparation of the notes before each service so that we can glean what, what we need from this important book, especially at this time, from, from our Lord through the prophet Malachi. So let's begin. And we'll start in Malachi, of course, chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, and then we'll come back and begin teaching. The Burden of the Word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord of hosts. Isn't that 
No, excuse me. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Now, isn't that something? <laughs> Malachi is a strong rebuke. This whole, this whole letter is a strong rebuke. And the Lord starts it off with, I have loved you. <laughs> God is love. God is love. And it's love reaching out to the people through the prophet Malachi. I just, it's a, I, I love that he starts it off with, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try not to comment quite so much. <laughs> the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, well, wherein hast thou loved us? And he says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. And, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Verse 4. Whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. That's what Edom says. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness. And the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see and you shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. I've got to say, even if you go back and read the story of Esau and Jacob, and good Lord, there's so many things to teach out of there. But for many, many years, I, I could not understand why the Lord said he loved Jacob and hated Esau. And other verses we go to plainly says that was the case before they were even born, <laughs> before they had done anything good or bad. <laughs> In my, uh, for many years, I just, it's one of the reasons I didn't teach the book of Malachi. I said, what? Because it just seemed so unfair, you know. And a lot of... Uh, a lot of denomin well not a lot, several denominations really jump on that aspect of the word and they say, see there it's predestination. You don't have anything to do with it. God decides even before you're born who he loves and who he hates and who's going to be saved and who he doesn't go who he's not going to save. You have nothing to do with it. I've argued with these people. <laughs> I said, Well you mean to tell me that a person that sees that hears the gospel sees that he's a sinner, understands that Jesus died for his sins, comes forward at the altar call, cries out to the, in the, for the name of the Lord, cries out in repentance, asks Jesus to come in his heart and save him. Are you telling me if he wasn't predestined to be saved, he won't be saved? And they go, that's exactly right. How many, how many verses do you have to throw out to believe something like that, see? And... Uh, one of, the, one of the ladies that I argued that with repeatedly for like six years or so, <laughs> she was a very high, high intellect person. I know her IQ was higher than mine. And every time I'd throw something out, boy, she'd come back at me, you know. I never did move her one inch off of that predestination thing. And afterwards, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I never did any good for you at all. I said, I, I never was able to convince her. Why did you have me in that situation with her for six years? He said, I wanted you to learn something and learn it well. Intellect is no safeguard against deception. <laughs> Whew, boy, that's the truth. That lady was really sharp, but she was deceived as a box of rocks. I mean, <laughs> whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There it is. What are you going to do with that? If you believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, thou shalt be saved. So many verses you could put in there. But, so, you know, there's something else with this, I have loved, uh, Esau have I hated, and Jacob have I loved. What in the world? So what do you do like that? Well, you keep assimilating the books and you pray in tongues like Pastor Dave Roberson told us. <laughs> 
And if that goes on for decades, it goes on for decades, you know. And I just have this up on the shelf, and commentaries were no help. I'm just telling you right now, I never, I, what I'm about to tell you, I never got out of a commentary. And there may be some out there that's got it. I'm, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just Gary. I just, I just know, <laughs> assimilate the book, pray in tongues, study the Greek words, so you know sometimes to know what the definitions are if you don't know what it means. But I didn't know what, well, I didn't know what the Lord. What is the revelation here? How is this? Because I know you don't predestine people for hell, whether they receive Jesus or not. That is not you. I know that's not you. Well, are you ready for this? I told you, one of the aspects that you have to look at uh, when you do an Old Testament, any Old Testament book, you have to understand how it applied to them that were under the law, but you have to also understand how it's prophetic. Everything points to Jesus. Everything. Everything points to the New Covenant. Everything. There are types and shadows everywhere. I love the Old Testament because it, it points everywhere to Jesus. It points to the new covenant. Well, let me just go ahead and see. I would. I used to tease like this and said, "Now, what I'm about to tell you took years of prayer and meditation of the word." <clears throat> Use my my toad voice, you know. Like, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, for a love offering of 1995. Uh, if you'll send it in, I'll send you my teaching. Uh, no, freely I receive, freely give. Okay, you ready for this? The only way you'll ever understand it, Esau and Jacob. These are types and shadows of Adam and Jesus. It's the first covenant compared with the second covenant. It's the first covenant based on works compared with the second covenant based on grace. It's works versus grace. Think about it. And I didn't look up all these verses, but you go back and read the story. Esau was a man of the earth. He was a very hairy man. He, he loved to hunt and fish, and there's nothing wrong with any of that. But the Bible, again, is drawing a picture. This is the man of the earth, very earthy, okay? And that's talking like about the first man, Adam. See, salvation based on performance failed again and again and again. Adam in the garden. Adam and Eve in the garden. It was a salvation based on performance. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. That's all they had to do, but it's still performance. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. You could eat the fruit of every other tree. That one? Nope. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. The day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, that's, that's works, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> to eat, you got to eat. <laughs> well, they failed. Later on, God gives the law. Blessed if you do, cursed if you don't. He's dealing with spiritually dead people. It's, a, it's salvation based on works. In the, the book of Galatians and other places, the Apostle Paul especially tells us that the law was given as a schoolmaster, pointing us to Jesus Christ because nobody could keep it. See, over and over again through the Old Testament, you're going to find out that, in, that salvation based on works of any kind, based on what man can do, based on earthly performance, fails over and over and over again. Man could not do it, no matter, even reducing it down to just the sin, don't eat the fruit of that tree. I mean, that's about as simple as it gets, okay? Yeah, the law was very complicated with hundreds of do's and don'ts, you know. But so I'm going to read this again. Salvation based on performance failed again and again and again. From Adam on, God, he, he had to de devise a different way to save man because Adam failed based on performance. That sin nature that came into him then was passed on to the whole human race. Every, you know, Eve is called the mother of all living. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, yellow, brown, polka-dotted, striped. It doesn't matter what you are. 
All of us can be traced back to Adam and Eve. Eve is the mother of all living. Everybody came from Adam and Eve. And so that sin nature is in each and every one of us when we're first born of our mother's womb. And the natural tendency is if I'm good, I, I, I'll be blessed. If I'm not good, I'll be cursed. And that natural tendency, that thinking, is a salvation based on performance. And it failed. It failed in the garden. Failed when God failed in Noah's day. I mean, in Noah's day, it was very minimal. I didn't look this up for you, but it was basically don't murder and like one other thing. It wasn't much. No, the commands were, well, they went totally wicked. <laughs> it says every thought, every imagination of the heart was evil and wicked all the time. And, you know, there's, you know, people live to be like hundreds of years old in the Old Testament. How many children do you have if you live to be eight or nine hundred years? <laughs> you know? And they say the population of the earth in Noah's time might have been very close or maybe even more than what the population of the earth is now. There might have been eight billion people on planet earth. Who knows? I'm, I'm, again, I'm not a scholar to that level at all. At least millions upon millions upon millions of people. Yet how many souls were saved? How many, how many righteous did God say? Well, not righteous. How many did he see that we're still serving him on planet earth? One, <laughs> one, and that was Noah. If, he, if, if, God, if Noah dies, there is no seed left. And, and God, he could have just wiped it out and started all over again. But he, again, in Noah's day, it was the final call. In Noah's day, he started over again with Noah and his family, eight souls all together were saved. God given another chance to the human race. He could have just wiped it out and started all over again, but nope, we're going to give him another chance. Again, even in Noah's day, in a way, it's for. Did you know Noah preached righteousness for a hundred years while he and his sons were building that boat? I think actually it was about 120 years. Again, I'm, I'm not you know super scholar. He said he was a preacher of righteousness. You know, people had had to come and see that ark. It's not something you could hide in your basement. <laughs> you know? I haven't been to the ark uh, in Kentucky, uh, the, the museum and everything they have set up there, but that's supposed to be life-size, I mean, to scale. And they tell me you can see that thing from way off. Well, it was had to be that way in Noah's day. And people, once the thing started really being built to scale, and they can, people had to come. What are you doing? What's going on here? And Noah would preach to him. He would preach about the coming judgment. He had, God had told him, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And no, you know, he was preaching righteousness. What does that mean? Repent. You know, stop all this wickedness and evil. And I, Dave, Pastor Dave, was the first one to ever, I ever heard say this. He said, can you imagine preaching for a hundred years and not have a single convert? He said, think about it. Even Noah's relatives, he had uncles and cousins and lots of relatives. Not an uncle, not an aunt, not, not a cousin, not one. How wicked was it? How wicked was the times? How wicked are our times? <laughs> Preach for a hundred years and not a single, nobody got on the boat with him, not one. Finally, God had enough. You know, you ever notice Noah didn't shut the door to the ark. God did. God did. Oh, see, I just want to go preaching right there. Hang on just a minute. <clears throat> Got a little. Freedom is not free, by the way. Freedom is not free. Our freedom cost heaven everything. Our freedom in America cost many soldiers everything. Well, anyway, I hope you're seeing the parallel here. Esau and Jacob is a type and shadow of the whole species of Adam compared with God's chosen people. See, God just chose Abraham. It wasn't based on works. And even though Abraham, he obeyed God, he, did, he wasn't perfect in his obedience. We could do a, I have done before, a whole uh, study uh, on, you know, Abraham's disobedience. There was many things that he did. I'm, are you glad people in, in heaven aren't perfect? <laughs> <laughs> thank God thank God while we all love Peter he made it you know 
<laughs> Peter actually rebuked the Lord one time, said, no, what you said is not true. This will not happen to you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We love Peter because he made it. If Peter made it, we can make it. Hallelujah. Let me say it another way. Salvation, the whole thing about Esau and Jacob, what he's trying to tell them, look, out of the whole human race, I chose you. I chose Abraham. You are his descendants. I chose you as my nation. I have loved you. I have blessed you. I gave you this. We could go back all of the things that he's done for the nation of Israel. I drove out the inhabitants of the land and I gave you the land and I have defended you and I have prospered you and I've blessed your fields and you on and on and on. God has demonstrated his love to them. See, but salvation based on works failed again and again, starting with Adam, up through Noah, up through the time of Moses, over and over and over again. But salvation based on works failed again and again and again. So God, he loved them enough, he come up with a new plan. Salvation based on the perfect work of one man. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Only one had to be perfect. And that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 6.29 that this is the work of God. That you believe on Him whom God hath sent. I believe on His perfect work. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It's not based on my performance. It's based on His performance. <laughs> and the fact that He shed His blood for me so I could be reborn of His Spirit. Glory to God, getting way ahead of myself. But this is the work of God. See, they kept watching Jesus do all of these miracles and signs and wonders. And really, they asked the same question that, that we've kind of asked. What must we do to do the works of God? We want to do that. I want to. And Jesus said we should in John 14, 12. He said, the works that I do shall you... Do. Well, He said, those that believe on me. Those that believe on me. The works that I do shall you do also and greater than these shall you do because i go unto my father he, he said we're going to do them so well what must we do to work the works of god and see notice how they word it plural what must we do to work the works plural of god boy he turns it around and he said no this is the singular this is the there's only one work for you what is my what is my work that you believe on him whom god has sent it's Christ in us. Everything is Christ in us. <laughs> You're, even your ability to walk above sin, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whew. Everything points to Jesus. Everything points to salvation through Christ. Oh, I love it so much. When he says, I have loved thee, listen, if God had not chosen Israel, let me say it another way, if God had not provided a salvation by a different method than works, nobody would be saved. Nobody would be saved because Romans 3.10 plainly says, and he's really just quoting the prophet Jeremiah, there is, as it is written, written by the prophet, there is none righteous. No, not one. If God had left salvation under the method of performance by man, nobody would be saved nobody would be saved that's why he has to completely reject the the fall of adam the whole the whole species of adam because they cannot be righteous they cannot do it nobody can nobody there everybody is born with that sin nature and if your salvation is based on your performance you're doomed no there's one work of god that we put our faith, our trust, our hope, not in your works, but in the perfect work of one man, Jesus Christ. And if you surrender to him and invite him in, if he becomes your Lord, you're saved based on his perfect work and not your own. God, the self. <laughs> Talk about God loving us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. God is love. 
even after man fell. See, when he says, when he says, I hated Esau, listen, if you go back and read, God blessed Esau's life. He blessed him a lot. But what he's saying is there's not two methods of salvation. Esau represents Adam, which is the failure of man to be saved by works. And it happened again and again and again. Okay? So he hates that thinking where you think you can be saved by your own effort. You cannot. He didn't hate Esau. God is love. But he has to reject that method to establish the new method, which is salvation by grace. And it's really faith in the finished work, the finished perfect work of one man. And that's Jesus Christ. That's, that's what God loves. And really, he just chose Abraham? Now, there's characteristics about a I mean, God knows what he's doing but still <laughs> and this nation he says I have loved you he just he just chose them all right now look Esau is a man of the earth earthy we, when you're born in, on this planet we all bear the image of the first man Adam earthy okay Christ he is the man from heaven he is the man of the spirit he is heavenly. When you get born again, you instantly bear that image in your spirit. You're remade, reborn in His image. And at present, we bear that image in our spirit. Your spirit man is cut from the same cloth. Can I say it that way? Your spirit man. Uh, I didn't look it up for you, but Ephesians chapter 4 says when you're born again, we are created, and that means instantly, from the get-go, the moment you're born again, you are created in righteousness and true holiness. And it says, after the image of him that created him, you're, you're reborn in your spirit in the very image of Christ. Now, we have scripture for all of that. Let me read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 49. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, Adam, that's, or the last Adam, that's Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man, that's Adam, is of the earth, earthy. Esau is a type of that hairy, red of the earth. Okay. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Now, verse 48. Let me turn the page here. All right. as, it is, as, as is the earthy, so are they that are earthy. That's all the descendants of Adam. If you're not born again, you're of the earth, earthy. Okay. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Well, that's everybody that's born again. You're in your spirit, the part of you that got reborn, you bear the image of Christ. It's, it's a, it, you have a righteous nature from him. The same way that you had a sin nature from Adam. Okay. Now notice verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, well, we certainly have, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Well, now he's talking about a glorified body. See, we already have the image of Christ in our spirit. We are progressively bearing that image outwardly as our minds are renewed with the word of God. See, and that's Romans 12 too. I looked that one up for you. Be not conformed to this world. Now he's talking to Christians that are already born again. They already have the image of God in their spirit. But what about your walk? What do other people see in your life? Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So again, inwardly in your spirit, you're already created in the image of Christ. Now, your walk, what other people see in your, how you live, that's, that changes progressively as your mind is renewed to the Word of God. 
I, 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 nowadays, I, it's even more than that. It's your mind to me. It's see, Jesus is the Word of God. He's called the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is with God. The Word was God. So forth. As your mind is renewed to the Word of God, you think like Jesus. You, you literally, His mind becomes your mind. You, every decision is not what what would Jesus do. It's what will Jesus do because He's alive and well. Thank you. You actually see Paul. He he came to the point where he he wrote, when he wrote to the Philippians, he said, "For me, as for me." In other words, as far as I'm concerned, for me to live is Christ. Well, he'd come to the point where he had so surrendered his life and his will, same way Jesus did to the Father. He says, "I'm." He, Jesus said, "I'm not here to do my own will. I'm here to do the will of Him that sent me." Paul came to that same place. He said, "I'm not living my life the way." according to my own will. I'm not living according to my will. I'm living according to the will of Christ. He's the one that sent me, and I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm living His life. His life is being lived through me. One time I saw a little vision, almost a little teaching vision, and it's like Paul had a zipper on his body, and he could, he could unzip. He could step out of his body, and the Lord Jesus could step in. And the point was, if you watched that, if, if Jesus could step into Paul's body and you watched him all day, what he did, you wouldn't see anything different than what you're going to see with Paul in, his, in that body. Because his mind had become so renewed to the mind of Christ, there was no difference. Christ is literally living his life through Paul. That's exactly what's supposed to happen with us, that the life of Jesus be made manifest in our mortal bodies. Hmm. Hallelujah. So, eventually, we will bear that image, not only in our spirit, not only in our renewed mind, but we're actually going to get a glorified body like His. See, Philippians chapter 3, look at verses 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. All I know is this, in a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, we shall be changed. Oh, oh, we're gonna go from this, you know. I, I look at my hands now, I'm 76, you know, I remember when, as a little boy, I'd study my grandpa's hands, you know, and boy, they were a lot of decades and decades of hard work out in the sun. You know, they, they worked hard, boy, in those days. And I'd look at those wrinkled old hands, and I'd say, man, grandpa's hands, he's been through a lot. Now, I look at these hands, and I go, grandpa, <laughs> grandpa, I got my grandpa's hands. Oh, my. Anyway. <laughs> This vile body, and I thank God for the body I have. I thank God that I'm still able to walk and talk and and uh, do you know do these type of things. And I thank God for this body, but I'm sure look, looking forward to that that new one that's made like Jesus's body. I want to walk through a wall, eat a fish, and then walk back through the wall and the fish not slide down the wall. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, that's just me. <laughs> now, Edom by the way, was the land of Esau, okay? Because Malachi talks about Edom here in these verses. Maybe I ought to back up and read it again. I've talked so much. See, in verse 4, Malachi 1, 4, he says, uh, Where, Wherefore Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. But thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. What in the world, you know? I mean, I can understand it from the time that they lived there. But see, here's the thing. Both Edom and Israel were conquered and destroyed by other nations, the land of Esau and the land of Jacob. They were both conquered by other nations. But Edom, Edom is the land of the descendants of Esau. That's, that's where Esau and his descendants lived. 
Israel is the land of inheritance of the descendants of Jacob, as you know. See, both were destroyed. Both of those lands were conquered. But Edom was not rebuilt, even though they said they would. Israel was rebuilt. Why? I have loved thee. God spoke through Isaiah, the prophet, over 150 years before Cyrus was ever born. God spoke through a prophet and called Cyrus by name 150 years before he was born that Cyrus was going to start the ball rolling, if you'll let me say it that way, so the temple could be rebuilt and eventually the walls could be rebuilt and the nation of Israel be established again. I have loved thee. Remember, they were still talking. God is telling this land. He's telling this people. They've been through the judgment. I have loved you. Edom, I may say it this way, the land of Adam. You're going to see it in a minute. Edom was never, re was never rebuilt, never will be rebuilt. Not like it was. But I have loved you, Israel. I have loved you. And I have allowed, I have spoke through a heathen king to send you back to rebuild the temple, rebuild the walls, and reestablish. I have loved you, says the Lord. But see, everything, listen, everything that the first Adam touched, everything that sin has ever touched, is going to be destroyed. See, God is not a quitter. He started, if you read the Genesis chapter 1, God intended for a perfect earth, perfect heavens, perfect man, where righteousness, not sin. That's what God wanted and that's what God is going to have. Now, as you know, sin has corrupted everything. And everything, all of that corruption, everything, did you know the corruption has even affected the universe? I mean, it's the planets even. Can't get into that today. But everything that the first Adam touched, and I'm talking about fallen Adam, everything that he touched is going to be destroyed. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth for the sons, sons and daughters of God to live in. All of those who are born again through faith in Jesus Christ... That's the reason he hasn't already destroyed this planet. He's still harvesting. He's still waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. God is not a quitter. What he's doing, he's rescuing from that dead species of Adam through, through faith in Jesus Christ. He is rescuing as many people as he possibly can before the end of this planet comes. But I'm telling you, everything Adam touched is going to be destroyed. I'm going to read it to you out of Scripture here in a minute. The old heaven, now listen, just like Edom, the old heaven and the old earth will never be rebuilt. It's going to be gone forever. That's what, prophetically, that's what he's saying here. He says, Edom says, oh yeah, we will rebuild when I'm done. No, they won't. No, no, I'm going to rebuild my land for my people. But Edom, the land of Adam, the whole species of Adam, that's going to be gone forever and it'll never be rebuilt. If you want scripture for all of that, here's you can turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The heavens will pass away <laughs> with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up that means completely concerned consumed i did a word study on that word where it says the elements shall melt with fervent heat in the the original language it's actually talking about the molecular structure down to the atomic level gone it didn't use the word atoms but that's the picture Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Look at the word dissolved. It means like you ever see put sugar in a tea? It's, it's gone. Where did it go? 
It's dissolved. Can't see it anymore. Yeah. All these things shall be dissolved. <laughs> Makes you wonder all that stuff that we strive so hard for. Better house. Better car. Oh, I need the latest computer. Uh, I need the, all of these all of these things that we give our, you know, we t mankind, <laughs> the earthy part, <laughs> give your lives for, you know, make payments on it forever. All of this, all of these things, everything, gone, dissolved, melted with a fervent heat. <laughs> it said, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, like just gone. What manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. God is not a quitter. I have loved you. Those of you that surrender to Jesus Christ and become born again, I'm going to make a new heaven and a new earth for you. It's not going to be like it was before. Righteousness will, will reign therein. It won't be, a, won't be a, a life of sin and sickness and disease and crime and all of the things that are going on in this world. Now I'm going to make a new heaven and a new earth for you, for I have loved you, says the Lord. Oh, the, the type and shadows from Malachi pointing all the way to the end. Let me give you one more witness about this new heaven and this new earth. This is all the way to Revelations chapter 21 and 1 through 5. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It wasn't just Peter that saw it. <laughs> John saw it too. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. That means gone. And there was no more sea. Mm, even the oceans will be gone. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It's really talking about us. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself, I love that himself, shall be with them and be their God. Now listen, this is how it's going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. It's worth giving your life for him now. Make sure you're on that planet. <laughs> Verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. Can you imagine? There shall be no more death. God never intended for death to be part of the human race. He never intended for death to be a part of this planet, a part of our lives. We, we, we can't even imagine that. Well, Imagine it. <laughs> there shall be no more death, neither sorrow. Can you imagine? <laughs> Nor crying. How about this one? Neither shall there be any more pain. <laughs> I, I lose words. <laughs> no more pain. This is our God. I have loved you. I have loved you, says the Lord. I have something wonderful prepared for you. Because you couldn't work to save yourselves, because I, you, mankind failed again and again and again. I loved you so much, I made another way for you to be saved. Instead of you having being perfect with your works, because nobody could do it, I made a new way where you can believe in the perfect work of my son. If you put your faith in him, you can be saved. I'll birth you again. You can come over from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It's salvation by grace instead of works. Adam, the earthy man, the earth, 
the heavens, everything to do with that first, everything Adam touched, everything sin and death ever touched is going to be gone like erasing a blackboard and starting again. And I'm going to make a new heaven for you and a new earth for you. There's not going to be any more death. There's not going to be any more sorrow. I'm going to wipe away every tear. There's not even going to be any more pain. Oh. Peter says, what manner of life should we be living right now? <laughs> you see, gratitude, thankfulness, holiness unto the Lord. Right now would be a good place. We'll get into it next next uh, week, I'm sure. But this is where Paul writes in the first, uh, Romans 12, 1. He said, based on the mercies of God and everything he's done, I beg of you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God for his use. See, it's the least we can do. God, what does he need? He needs our bodies. He needs our love. He needs our surrender. But all of that is so he can live the life, so that Christ, the very life of Christ, can be lived through these bodies. These are the sacrifice that we offer unto God. And he said, it's your reasonable service. Paul, Peter says, what manner of life should we be living holy, seeing the promise that is to come? We want to be sure we live there. I didn't quite finish. I got to read verse 4 again. <laughs> God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain. Now notice, for the former things are passed away. Verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Oh my God, I just want to worship God. I just, see... In the first, just the first five verses, that's all we've got to today. <laughs> I have loved you, says the Lord. Boy, has He loved us. God has so loved us with all of our rebellion and our sin and everything that we've done, and He's still holding out this love to us. It's like He was the prophet Malachi. He's holding out His love to them one more time. And through this book, you're going to see He's so trying to get them to repent and turn to Him, to to respond to his love that he's shown over and over and over again to them. So God is so trying to rescue us out of this fallen species of Adam, the Esau, the type and shadow Esau, the, the hairy man, the earthy man. That, all of that, everything, everything sin ever touched, everything Adam ever touched, if you'll allow me. None of that is going into the new heavens and the new earth. That is going to be gone. Again, I see it like a race in a chalkboard. It will be gone. There's no finding it again. And God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Boy, I want to live there. I want to go there. See, what manner of life should we be living, Peter says, based on these kind of promises? Holy conversation. Oh, my goodness. And that's what God's after. In the, through the prophet Malachi, he is holding out again his love. I have wonderful things for you. I have wonderful things coming for you. Please repent and turn back to me. Please respond to my love. I have loved you, says the Lord. We'll see you again next week.